Welcome to part 3 of video series on ethics and professional practice. In this video, we are going to talk about rubrics that are to be considered in engineering ethics. By rubrics for ethics, I don't mean a moral compass. As a matter of fact, moral compass is something we all have inside us. That's what we use when you are facing certain situations and uh, dealing with some people in everyday life. Rubrics, on the other hand, are less flexible than individual's moral compass. So these rubrics are to be used in uh, situations where there are some ethical dilemmas persist in your practice. Let's get started. First, we are going to talk about some of the ethical theories. Then, what I call as the prime directive for engineers, followed by the most important takeaways from this video, which is the ethical hierarchy for engineers. And then, finally, we will touch on how to approach applying these rubrics to resolving ethical dilemmas. Ethical theories. There are a number of other ethical theories, but we only pick five that we believe that have some relevance to engineering ethics. They are deontology, consequentialism, rights theory, justice theory, stakeholder or act utilitarian theory. First up, deontology. This ethical position prescribes adherence to a rule or a set of rules. The simplest way to characterize deontology is that just do your duty. The central philosophy behind deontology is called categorical imperative. Categorical means without exception. Imperative means duty to perform it. Categorical imperative was first proposed in 1785 by Immanuel Kant. It is an absolute, unconditional requirement that must be obeyed in all circumstances and is justified as an end in itself. There are a couple of tests that are performed as a part of categorical imperative. The first one is principle of consistency or test of consistency. It asks the hypothetical question, what if everyone took such an action? That action is considered consistent if everyone accepts it. But there is one problem. It ignores the consequences. I don't want to get into theology in here or any other video, but I do want to merely cite an example of deontology in religion, specifically Hindu religion. Before the great war of Kurukshetra, Arjuna, the warrior, didn't want to fight. He dropped off his weapons and walked off the battlefield because on the other side, he sees his friends and relatives and he didn't want to kill them. Lord Krishna then, as the legend have it, Lord Krishna then schooled Arjuna about his duties. A notable phrase from that preaching is, Karmanye vadhikaraste mafaleshu kadachana. Your job is to do your duty and not worry about the consequences, which was to, of course, fight the war and kill people. The second test of categorical imperative is, the principle of respect, are people treated as ends rather than means? We all heard about the phrase, ends do not justify means. If somebody or a group of people are harmed in arriving at the ends, can the harm to those individuals be justified? Here's an example of that principle of respect. Most consumers love inexpensive goods, right? Will the acceptance or consumption of the cheap goods change if they were produced in human sweatshops halfway across the world? I'm just asking the question. Here is another way to put the same test, which is the principle of respect. It's also known as the front page test. What if my decision is reported on the front pages of the New York Times? Will then my action be justified? Consequentialism, it's exact opposite of the philosophy which states ends do not justify means. The philosophy of consequentialism is that consequences of one's conduct or act 
are the ultimate basis for any judgment about the rightness or wrongness of that conduct or act. It speaks for itself in a vast majority of the cases I, in some of my personal experiences, ends do not necessarily always justify the means. And then we have the rights theory, which is based on the individual rights and giving respect to those rights. The individual rights set forth by a society are protected and given the highest priority in this theory. Here is one strong assumption. Rights are considered to be ethically correct and valid since a large or ruling population endorses them. Is it really? Take the example of 1944 America and 1944 Hitler's Germany. In America, we have freedom of religion. In Hitler's Germany, you have persecution of Jews. Both rights are endorsed by the large or ruling population. But clearly one is wrong. The dilemma is, how do you decipher what the characteristics of a right are in a society? Under justice theory, where fair and distribution of benefits and burdens are assigned, everybody is equal. Everybody is equal before justice, unless, of course, there are justifiable extenuating circumstances. This justification should be based on a consistent logical basis. For example, a policeman has to drive under the speed limit just like everybody else under normal circumstances, right? But he is allowed to speed over the limit, speed over the limit to arrive at a scene of crime to prevent the crime, apprehend the criminal, or even save lives. The consistent logical basis here would be to notify the dispatch and turn the siren while speeding. Act utilitarian theory is a stance that the morally right act will do the greatest good to the greatest number of people. And the caveat here is, regardless of personal feelings or the societal constraints such as existing laws. Rule utilitarian theory is another variation of the utilitarian theory. It seeks to benefit the most people but through the fairest and most just means available. The added benefits here, of course, are that it values justice and it, it includes beneficence at the same time. We need to talk a little bit more about the shortcomings of the utilitarian theory because act utilitarian theory is what forms the basis for engineering ethics. You can't know the future for sure and therefore you cannot predict the outcome of any of your decisions. Intentions may be to do the most good for the most people, but what if it doesn't turn out that way? Unexpected results making the utilitarian look unethical at the same time passes because somebody's choice did not benefit the most people as he predicted. For example, you designed an airbag system to save lives. You tested it using all state-of-the-art protocols and tools and deemed it safe. Your employer, the auto company, deployed these airbags in millions of cars. In some weather condition, which you failed to test, the airbag exploded and killed people instead of saving lives. Then the utilitarian now seems to have chosen an ethical decision. So which means that the utilitarian seems to have chosen an ethical decision to deploy the airbags. Is it? You might have noticed when talking about ethical theories, I asked some questions and didn't answer any of them or most of them. And that was intentional because most of the ethical dilemmas are some things that are, you know, that depend on individuals' moral compass. But there is one prime directive, as you might probably can tell, I'm a big Star Trek fan, and the guiding principle of the United Federation of the Planets is something that prohibits Starfleet personnel from interfering with the internal development of the alien civilizations. So there is nothing about alien civilizations here on Earth, but the prime directive for the engineers is that an engineer has to act in the best interest of the society at large, which is 
an ethical basis based on act utilitarian theory and which is which is what forms the basis for engineering ethics when you are faced with ethical dilemmas while you are practicing engineering or just simply have a question that is asked in your fe exam or a pe exam whatever consider this hierarchy which we developed this hierarchy gives you the responsibility of an engineer and it goes in this order first and the foremost priority of an engineer is society and the public at large. And that's the top priority. Your second priority is going to be the law. Let's deviate slightly from this list and talk about law versus ethics. Most people tend to think that law is above everything, which it is not. More often than not, law plays a catch up with ethics. For example, abolition of slavery. It took nearly 90 years after independence and a civil war before slavery could be abolished in America. Today, nobody would deny that it was unethical for women to prevent, for, uh, prevent voting in the 19th century America, but it's not until early 20th century women could vote in America legally. And that's the power of ethics over law. So law is something that creates rules and guides the conduct, whereas ethics offers guidelines on conduct. And law balances competing values, whereas ethics prioritizes situations in which competing values clash. Law punishes conduct that is illegal through formal structures, whereas on ethics, you don't go to jail if you violate ethics. You can probably lose your license, that's about it. But Incentives, there are incentives and disincentives which may be created by a group. For instance, for civil engineers, there is a group of uh, professional engineers and each state board has their own group of professional engineers which sets this uh, code of conduct. And also professional organizations like American Society of Civil Engineers uh, does uh, play a role in uh, creating these incentives and disincentives. And that's the differentiating thing between law and ethics. Coming back to the hierarchy, the third priority of an engineer is to his or her own profession, the engineering profession. And then the engineer's client. The fifth priority is going to be the engineering firm or the employer. And the sixth one is to other engineers in the same discipline you are practicing. And finally, the engineer himself or herself, finally the self. Now take another good look at the top priority and the last priority. This is what I call an inverted pyramid. It goes something like this. So you have at the top the highest number of people served. At the bottom you have the lowest number of people served. So if you think of this inverted pyramid as your priority, is so the most good to the most people is where at the top that should be your priority the the most good to the lowest number of people that is you have to be the last priority now keep this hierarchy in mind if there is going to be one takeaway from this entire video for that matter for this entire video series on ethics this got to be it if you keep this in mind if you etch this in your mind you will be able to resolve any ethical dilemmas, especially with the ones that come in your FE exam, this is it. So keep this in mind, take a snapshot of this screen and then save it somewhere. Now that we talked about ethical theories and the hierarchy, which I call them as rubrics, let's see how to apply them. So when you're trying to apply, there is no formula to solve the ethical problems. You must consider trade-offs. What are the relevant facts you have to gather? Who are all the stakeholders? And what are the options? Like you, you choose option one, option two, or option three. And for each option, what are the consequences? So you, you have to consider the consequences. If you, you cannot go by deontology, which is not applicable to the engineering ethics. What is, what is the potential harm to each set of stakeholders? In other, in other words, this is where we are applying the 
test of principle of respect. And once you do all that, prioritize the beneficiaries and consider that inverted pyramid I am talking about and reach your at the highest point and the, your ethical dilemma is resolved. And that is when you decide and take an action. And that's it for the third video. And uh, I hope uh, you learned something here. I will see you in video number four.